Uh, we are just so glad that you're here today and excited to be with you. And we're going to be in uh, the second portion of a sermon I started last week. But if you weren't here last week, that's okay. Uh, this one will work just fine on its own. And we're going to be in the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth of the Gospels. We're going to be in John 4. And we're going to look at this interaction that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman. Um, now, contrary to the social norms of the day of Jesus, we find Jesus making his way through Samaria, and, and there he stops at Jacob's well, and he, he meets a woman, this Samaritan woman. And, and he meets this woman who has this incredibly deep wound in her life, right? And, and some scholars would say this wound in her life is, is because of sexual infidelity. Others have suggested it's probably not that, that it's more like uh, perhaps adultery, or she's experienced divorce. But what we know from this story is that she has deep loss. She has been married five times with a man now who is her sixth, but is not someone she is married to. And so she's someone who's struggling. She's struggling with shame and, and, and perhaps guilt and doubt and all kinds of other things, living with this, this woundedness of having had five husbands and now being with a sixth guy. And last week we talked about how all of us have wounds. The, the Samaritan woman, much like us, she defends and she deflects and she doesn't want Gen Jesus to enter into her woundedness. And so when Jesus starts talking to her about the subject, she kind of tries to change the subject. But Jesus says to her, I, I know your wound. I know what you are hiding. And he, and he basically says to her, I didn't come here that you should just feel guilt or doubt or anything like that. I didn't come here just to get some physical water because they're at a well. He says, I actually came here to give you access to eternal water that, that springs forth from me that has no end. And so that's where we're going to pick up these verses today. And what's incredible about what's happening here in John 4 is that it's just this Initially, a, a conversation between two people. There's, there's nobody else around. The, the disciples at this moment weren't with Jesus. And Jesus is just interacting with this woman um, who you would have never expected him to have this kind of interaction with. And so we pick up our text today in John uh, chapter 4, verse 27, if you want to follow along. There are some Bibles in the chairs and some on the Welcome Center. You'll see them up on the screen here. If you got a smartphone, uh, version is a great version, a great app, if you would like to use that. And I'm going to read to you uh, a number of verses here, and then we're going to dig in. So I'm going to start in John 4, 27. Just then, Jesus' disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town, and they were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here, holds, or here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others, they have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed with them there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet had no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So here are the main points that I 
kind of want us to look at and consider today. These are the main points. Jesus disciples the overlooked, he heals through wounds, and he dwells with his people. If you have your Bible still open, look back to verse 27. Again, Jesus and the Samaritan woman are there by themselves at the well. Nobody was around but the two of them. And at that point, Jesus' disciples walk up to Jesus, and the text says, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or, or why are you talking to her? And that brings us to this very first point, that Jesus disciples the overlooked. Last week we talked about how odd it was that, that Jesus would be having an interaction with a Samaritan. And it's just, it's frankly, culturally at this time, bizarre that he would be spending any time whatsoever in Samaria with a Samaritan. To the Jews, they, the Samaritans, were ethnic outsiders, racial outsiders. They, they, they were theological outsiders, social outsiders. They, they were outcasts. They were considered to be ritually unclean and theologically wrong. So the tension in this story is enormous. But that's not what surprises his disciples in verse 27, is it? It doesn't say that they were surprised he was talking to a Samaritan. What does it say? They were surprised he was talking to a woman. Not just that he's talking with a Samaritan, but that he's talking to a woman. Because you see, back at that time, in those days, for a rabbi to be talking to a woman, at best it was considered to be a distraction to his ministry, and at worst it was kind of to be a little bit sexually promiscuous as a rabbi to be speaking with a woman. That wasn't something they generally did. An ancient Jewish tradition held that speaking to a woman about the Torah, the very thing that Jesus was doing in this text that we had last week, well, it was not something that you did. In fact, it was virtually considered to be evil. And, and some people back at the time of Jesus had suggested that if you were going to teach your daughter or your wife the Torah, you might as well let them go into prostitution. That, that was the view of the day. It was the commonly held belief that there was literally no reason to be talking about theology with women. There was no reason for them to teach women the Bible, they felt. It, it was thought to be a waste of time. The overarching belief, according to Jesus' disciples, in fact, as we see in the story, was that the mission of God is taken forward with men. Strong men. Not women. Why is he talking to her? Because in this culture, women were largely an afterthought. They weren't thought of as important in the mission of God. They, 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 they were not believed to have any real place in the redemptive history of God and what God was doing in the world. I mean, the, the, the mindset of these disciples was, as long as we can make disciples of men, well, then we'll catch the women along with them. Let's reach the men. And Jesus' disciples are, are reflecting their cultural worldview in this story. The disciples believed the women were, were just add-ons to what they were doing. Uh, almost an afterthought to the mission of God. And they had succumbed to this bizarre and weird cultural narrative about gender, and not the biblical narrative about gender. Because you see, oftentimes we forget that our shared humanity precedes anything else. And it's more important than our, our sexual or biological distinctions. You see, Jesus' disciples were allowing gender to become more definitive of this person than of the fact that she was a person. That she bore the image of God. And the Bible teaches very clearly that both men and women are created in God's image. Not one created in God's image and the other a derivative form. But we both share fully in God's image as His representatives we see this all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis. So Jesus, rather than seeing her as an enemy, rather than seeing as her somebody to shun because of her sin, rather than seeing her as somebody to avoid because she's a woman, 
Instead, Jesus in the story is present with her. Jesus acknowledges her. He, he gives her a sense of of dignity, even as he's pressing in on her wound. Jesus disciples the disadvantaged. He dignifies them. He draws near to them, whether we want him to or not. That's what his mission is. Jesus' disciples overlooked this, but he did not. And here's what's incredible about this passage. Point number two. He heals through wounds. Look back at this text. As I mentioned earlier, we learned last week that this woman is wounded. She's carrying some baggage. A lot of baggage, in fact. She's had five husbands. The man she's with right now is not even her husband. And verse 28 says, So the woman, this is at noontime, left her water jar, the very thing she'd brought and come to be doing, she left her water jar, went away into town, and said to the people there, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And then it says, they went out of the town and were coming to him. Now jump down to verse 39, and it says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Remember she had said, he told me all that I did. We cannot afford to miss this. This woman who just verses earlier, perhaps minutes in real time, was hiding this emotional scar, this pain, this baggage, this woundedness. She was trying to hide that just moments ago from Jesus. She'd been deflecting. She'd been defensive about it. This, this wound that she has goes so deep in her that she wants to do anything but talk about it with this guy. She doesn't want to talk about her current relationship status. It's painful. It's embarrassing. It's so shame-filled. But then what happens? Jesus heals her wound. Then what happens? After Jesus heals her wound, she goes back into the town. The very thing that she'd been hiding from. See, she was coming to the well at noon to avoid the people in town. To avoid the other women. To not have to see them. To not have to hear them gossiping about her. To not have to be present with them. That she was so uncomfortable to be with them. She's there at noon. She's avoiding them in the heat of the day going to get water. Something you didn't do. She's trying to dodge this. And instead, what does she do? She receives healing from Jesus. And she goes and seeks those very people she was avoiding. She goes and seeks them out. She goes and shares the good news with them. She says in verse 29, Come see a man who told me about all that I ever did. Everything that she'd been hiding is what she is now leading with. The very thing that she was trying to hide from Jesus actually becomes the thing that propels her into mission. Friends, last week we talked about this, that each and every single one of us were wounded. You don't escape this life without taking some wounds. Every single one of us is carrying some shame, some guilt, remorse, embarrassment, pain from sin, sin that we've committed and sins that were committed against us. But our wounds don't have to keep us from living on mission. In fact, it is our wounds that can actually fuel our mission, according to this text. The very thing that she was hiding becomes the thing that she wants to display. I want to introduce you to a, a term that maybe you're not familiar with. It's the idea of a wounded healer. That somebody might receive healing through your woundedness. And I think that's what we see happening here with the Samaritan woman. Here's this woman who's received unbelievable amounts of grief and guilt 
and shame and embarrassment. And it's all things that she wants to hide. And all she wants to do is self-protect and defend, right? And Jesus begins to heal her. And what does she do? She becomes a wounded healer. She goes back into her town. She doesn't lead with her healing. She doesn't lead with her victory. She leads with her wound. She leads in her weakness. She leads with her own vulnerability. And maybe more than anything else I want you to hear today is this. That your deepest wounds are likely your greatest opportunity for ministry. Your deepest wounds, your deepest pains, your deepest regrets, your deepest frustrations, whether it's through your sin or someone's sin against you, Perhaps it's just because you live in a broken world. But it's those very places that God desires to use you. And they can become your greatest opportunities for ministry. And I believe this with all of my heart. That God is more interested in using your wounds than He is in using your gifts. He wants to use both. But your wounds tell a story that is powerful. And it's our deepest wounds where God's grace is most evident and clear. The very thing that that you and I want to most hide, the things that we want to protect, the things that we want to defend against, that is the very thing, that is the very place that God can use to tell a story that others might hear of His greatness. And whatever that is for you and for me, when you begin to accept that invitation to to open that woundedness of yours to Jesus, and you say to Him, Be with me. Heal me. It's there. It's in that, that space where God's grace becomes so evident in your life. It's that space where God's grace doesn't just stop at your life, but it goes out into all of those around you. The the invitation to have our wounds healed by Jesus is also an invitation for us to allow other people to be healed through our wounds. What if God wants to use your woundedness to bring healing to someone else? Someone who doesn't know the things that you've been hiding for years. What if your willingness to expose that sin, that pain, that hurt, that harm, that baggage? What if your willingness to be vulnerable could not only bring healing to you, but to those around you? Hear me in this. We all have wounds. We all have baggage. But your wounds don't scare Jesus. He's not put off by them. He's not put off by your sin. He's not put off by your brokenness. He's not afraid of you. Your brokenness is not off-putting. Rather, it's something that He is intimately aware of. There are so many incredible things about this passage. But in verse 39, it says there, the Samaritans believed. They believed this woman's testimony. Here's something I know. None of us escapes being wounded. Nobody. We are all wounded people. Whether physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. The main question is is not how can we hide our wounds so that we don't have to be embarrassed, but rather how can we take this woundedness and use it in service of others? Do you see how different that is? If we spend less time thinking about our pain, if we spend less time trying to hide our guilt and our shame, how might others experience healing through our vulnerability and our openness? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and they become a place of healing. 
It is then that we have become wounded healers. Friends, the very heart of the mission of God is not shown in our victories at all, but it's shown in our weakness and in Christ's victory. Because you see, it was His work, not mine. And so Jesus' disciples, the overlooked, and then He heals through the wound. And then finally, and I think this is incredibly important, He dwells with His people. Look back at the text in verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to Him, they asked Him to stay with them. If you're the kind of person who writes in your Bible, I would underline that, I would highlight that. He stayed with them. And He stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Back at this time, the people considered to be the people of God were the Jews, not the Samaritans. The belief was that supposedly the people of God were the Jewish people. That Jesus was going to come to Jerusalem and triumphantly enter. He's going to go into the temple. He was going to conquer. And then through that, God's presence was going to reinvade the world through God's religious people. Through God's ritually clean people. Through the people who had jumped through all the right hoops and all the right times and all the right places. if you know your story, you know that Jesus had just been to Jerusalem. What was it that the Jerusalemites had said to him? They basically said, get out of here. We don't want to be in your presence. See, they were comfortable with their religious rituals and rules. They were comfortable with their mundane spirituality. They had a religion that wasn't based on the presence of God. It was based on their human practices. So then what does Jesus do then? Well, he goes off and takes a hike through Samaria to people where God's presence was never supposed to go. To people who were ritually unclean, who were theologically wrong, and who were social outcasts. They were ethnically different. They were the ones who were never supposed to get it. The very people, the very people, you would think would accept, would seek, would desire, would yearn, would want the presence of God. They missed it. And they think that their religious and spiritual lives continue to going forward without the presence of Jesus. Why was that? Because, you see, the Jews didn't see themselves as a wounded people. They saw themselves as a victorious people. They were just waiting for the victory. And then we read about the Samaritans. People who knew they were wounded. People who knew they were outcasts. They were desperate. They're the ones who think, would anybody really miss us if we weren't here? Are we even part of God's plan? Does God even desire to use a people like us? We're sinful, we're broken, we're a wounded people. And it is there, and it is them, that meet face to face with God. And rather than asking some deep theological question of Him, what do they ask of Jesus? Jesus, will you just stay here with us? Jesus, will you just stay here? At the very, very heart of Christian life is a deep yearning, a a desire, and an expectation around the presence of God being very present in our lives. The psalmist talks about it this way. Many of you all know this. As a deer pants for the streams of living water, right? 
so my soul longs for you. Often when we think of that verse, right, we kind of think of this doe, this healthy deer that's out, you know, running around, trancing along a, a beautiful green, you know, northern Minnesota stream, don't we? Right, we got so many deer, so much water, and so many streams up here. That's kind of our, our mental image. Is this, this healthy doe just going to the river, getting a drink, and everything is glorious. But that's not what the psalmist is trying to say. What is the psalmist trying to say? The psalmist is trying to say that, that we are like a deer who is dehydrated, right? Minutes away from death. That, 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 that dehydration that's so deep that, that your eyes are bulging, that your, your, your tongue is swollen, that, there's that, that the froth is at the corners of the deer's mouth because it hasn't experienced water for so long. And you're so desperate for water that you'll do absolutely anything to find some. Are you desperate for the presence of God in your life? Or are you like the Jerusalemites who were just willing to keep going through the motions of their simple religious practice? Are you so wounded and so aware of your shame and of your weakness, of your brokenness and of your sin, sins that caused by your own actions are against you, that it's only through Jesus that you could be healed. That's where the Samaritans are. And they simply say to Jesus, would you just stay here with us? How do you get the presence of God in your life? It's not through ritual. It's not through a program. It's not through knowing more about the Bible. It's not through participating in a Bible study. What is it? You simply ask just ask just ask for God for Jesus to be present are you hurting in pain what kind of baggage do you have what kind of skeletons do you have in your closet things that you are scared somebody else might find out about Jesus wants to be with you he wants to stay there with you. Not in your wholeness, not in your health, not in your healing, but in your woundedness. One of the things I love about this passage is that it says the Samaritans originally believed because of the woman's testimony. And then they hear Jesus. And they hear his words and they're like, wow, that is so much better. The presence of Jesus in your life is your only hope. And I want you to think for a few minutes as we wrap up here about your woundedness. What are your wounds? The likelihood is we all have wounds. I know this is a complex question that you may not be able to answer here right away just today. For some of us it's just one thing, but for some of us it's one thing that affects all of the other things in our lives. Maybe nobody else in the world knows about that pain that you carry with you. Maybe it's from years ago. Maybe it's from yesterday. But you've never told a soul. Maybe it's something that everybody knows, like this woman in the story, right? They all knew of her story. Maybe you've been hiding from it and deflecting. Maybe your shame has just been too great. When you think about that sin or that brokenness or that pain or that harm, it can be so hard to go to that place. And I just want you to do something simple as we wrap up. I want you to do just as the Samaritans did and just say, Jesus, will you be present here with me in my woundedness? Jesus, will you be my wounded healer? I want you to ask Jesus to come into that wound, to, to invade your shame and your guilt, and to bring you truth and to bring you grace. Because here's what you need to know. 
Our sins and our wounds are innumerable. But His grace is so much more. Our sins and our wounds are innumerable. But His grace overcomes. First Peter tells us that by His wounds you have been healed. Jesus is God's wound healer who brings us grace and brings us mercy, who brings us peace as the great high priest. So what does the Samaritan woman do when she goes back into her town? She goes in and says, Hey, he knew all about me. He knew about my brokenness. He knew my story. He knew who I was. And he loved me anyhow. We can do the same because it's by His wounds that you also can be healed. Jesus is right now sitting at the right hand of the Father pleading His wounds by His blood on your behalf. When He looks down at us, He says, that one, that one's mine. She's mine. He's mine. No more guilt. No more shame. That's my son. That's my daughter. It's our deepest wounds where God's grace is most evident because it's in Christ's wounds where His grace is most present. Think about that this week. Quit hiding and let God use your wounds to heal you and then heal others in that process. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you that in moments like these we are reminded that we don't come to church as the people who have figured it out. We don't come as the ones who have the perfect life. We don't live without sin. No, God, we come to church as the broken as the beggars in need of a piece of bread, as sinners in need of a Savior. And God, if that was the end of the story, it would be tragic, because we would be lost in the depths of our sin. We would spend all of our time hiding our brokenness, living in guilt and living in shame. But God, you tell us you came to overcome that. You came to live a life we could not live, to die a death we could not die, to rise again, to conquer sin in the grave. And God, if we would lean into that, if we would put our hope and trust in you, if we would trust that you indeed can heal any wound, no matter how deep, no matter how bad. But if we put our hope and trust in you, we can be forgiven. And then in that God we can move forward, no longer living in guilt and shame. And in fact, we can instead turn that into a story and tell people about your goodness. God, I pray this week that we could become wounded healers. That we could come and share our story with others like us who have an experience like us, who need to know of your goodness. God, it is with fear and trepidation that we step forward in faith trusting that you can use us in our brokenness to heal others. So God, as we go forth this week, may we encounter those who need our grace, who need to hear of our story and our mercy, that we might point them towards you. God, in all that we do, may we magnify and glorify you. We thank you for your son Jesus, for his great love, Continue to empower us and lead us from this place. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close today, there will be a a prayer team here at the front. If you need some prayer, if you need to talk about a wound, if you just need to share, maybe get a hug. They will be here for you. Come on up and they would do that with you. Otherwise, as you go, if you'd make your way down towards the gym, lunch will be served there.
I'm going to say that you are all blessed to eat. We say thanks to all who have served. God is good and he's provided this wonderful meal for us and we are thankful for it. So eat it with joy to his glory and then let's have some fun together. Uh, after we eat, we're going to have a cupcake eating contest. And it's not going to be by volume, it's going to be by speed. We're going to need some volunteers. So start thinking right now, leave one extra taco off your plate because I've got to need a couple of people to eat some, some cupcakes, okay? With that, go forth and serve your king. Thanks for coming. Jesus loves you. Amen.